Welcome to Life Church. We are a family on a mission to bring the life of Jesus to Warrington. So welcome to online church, whether you're in Warrington or Goldbourne, and I know there are some people that are from further afield. Wherever you are, welcome to church. It's great to see you. So my name's Lisa. I'm normally the one that's chatting a little bit too much in the chat function, so I apologise for that. However, it is great to see you here. I want to start by reading something from the Bible from John 16. Um, it's at the point where Jesus has been with his disciples for a few years now. They've seen everything he's done and what he's achieved and what he said about himself. Starting at verse 31, he says, You believe at last, Jesus answered, but a time is coming and has come when you will be scattered each to his own home. You will leave me all alone, yet I am not alone for my father is with me. I have told you these things so that in me you may have peace. In this world you will have trouble, but take heart. I have overcome the world. And it's that part where it says, yes, you will be scattered each to his own home. And right now, as I speak to you, we are all in our own homes. We have all been scattered in that sense. But it says that we are not alone. That the Father is with us that there will be trouble, but Jesus has overcome. And we know that by faith, as the disciples knew at that moment. So I just want to pray for us before our, as our service starts now. Lord, I thank you that you have overcome. I pray right now for my brothers and sisters who are in homes across Warrington and Goldbourne, that we will come together, we will worship together, we will learn together because we are one body and I thank you for them. Thank you, Jesus, for your sacrifice. Amen.
Let's start walking. Hello everybody, me and Lois are here. We're just going to quickly pray for our road, Liverpool Road. So Lord, I pray for everybody on the road mm. and I pray that you would save them all. Amen. Amen. Father, I pray that we will be able to be vessels in our communities. Father, that we will have a spirit of boldness and courage to be able to share who you are to our communities. Amen. Amen. <laughs> <laughs> walking in the neighborhood with a small person um, so yes Lord Jesus we just pray for our neighbors for those who live near us um, who live on this road we pray Lord Jesus your blessing and your protection over them in your mighty name Lord Jesus There's no power like the power of Jesus. 
in your heart It's not just your gifts we want Please come and visit as the rain Fall on us, we pray Holy Spirit, come And flood every part of us Holy Spirit, come And flood every part of us Spirit, it's you we need Like fountains from the deep Flow as a river running wide Please share what's in your heart Will lead to what you want Your words are leadership and life Come and purify Holy Spirit come Spirit come and flood every part of us. Holy Spirit come and flood every part of us. Oh, Holy Spirit.
minutes, today we're gonna talk about the third thing you need to know as a Christian. And there are only three things, so it's pretty simple. See, we wanna keep it really easy so you don't get confused and start making up excuses. So we learn that we start by trusting Jesus, we live to honor God, and today we're gonna talk about truth number three. We grow by helping others. Did you know that you can't grow by just taking, 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 taking? If you wanna grow up, if you wanna be mature, you gotta to learn to look out, look around, and help people around you. Use your freedom to serve one another in love. Think about it. Who's the most mature person in your house? Probably your parents, right? And what do they spend their whole week doing? Helping you. Because they're the grown-ups, so they help. And if you wanna grow up as a Christian, you have to learn to help. So we grow by serving people. If you wanna be the most mature person ever, you have to learn to serve people around you. Did you know that this is what Jesus did for his disciples? He was the master, he was Jesus, he was God, and yet he washed his disciples' feet like a servant. Ugh, gross. In that day, only the lowest servants would wash someone's feet, and yet Jesus did it for his disciples. And after washing their feet, he put on his robe again and sat down. And he asked, do you understand what I was doing? You call me teacher and Lord, and you're right, because that's what I am. And since I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you ought to wash each other's feet. I have given you an example to follow. Do as I have done to you. Kids, if you wanna grow in your faith, you should serve people around you, like your parents, brother and sister, and kids at school. And here's another way to grow. We grow by giving money. Did you know at church you can give money in the offering? Now, you might think, I don't have very much money. I mean, I'm just a kid. But it doesn't matter because giving is still a way for you to grow. It doesn't matter how much you give. It just matters that you have a heart to give. That you don't just keep all your money and spend it on yourself. But you're willing to give to church and to missionaries and to people who need it. And here's the greatest way to grow. It's by sharing your faith. You know, that you tell other kids about who Jesus is to you. That you invite them to become a Christian, just like you became a Christian. Maybe you can invite them to church or to Sunday school or invite them to your small group or a family devotional. The point is, if you can look outward and help other people, then you will really start to grow up as a Christian and you'll have a strong foundation for the rest of your life. We start by trusting Jesus we live to honor God, and we grow by helping others. so exposed when my bank manager saw my account as to where I spent direct debits, standing orders and transactions because the priorities of my heart were laid bare and God sees where I spend my time and my money. Weeks. But unless we put wheels on those things it doesn't mean very much. In fact James says this, he says that faith without works is dead and so when we start to put those things into mobilization, they impact others in our life. You know, However, if you continue in life to make decisions, but in partnership with the Holy Spirit, see how God can fill the gap between your resources and what by faith he's calling you to do. week in Life Church we have devotions 7am on Wednesday morning so there will be a zoom link sent out click on that 
You don't need your video on or anything like that if you can't face people seeing you at 7am. But come along for prayer and devotion. It's a great time, just 20 minutes. Also on Wednesday, 8pm is the last in the current series of Logos with Dave Ackerman. So again, come along on Zoom for that. That will be amazing. We continue our series on spiritual fitness today. You know, back in the day, if you played computer games and you got stuck in a particular game, there was a number you could call where you would be able to talk to an expert who had played that game through many times and they'd be able to tell you how to solve the puzzle that you couldn't get through or how to get past a certain uh, boss level that you couldn't get past. There were people who were at the end of the phone who could help you. Uh, today, that doesn't happen so often. In fact, from the, the kind of the widespread um, influence of the, in, of the internet, um, the whole concept of calling this number kind of died out because people who would play computer games would then uh, write about how to play that game and post it on their web page. Uh, that whole um, process, that whole concept is called a walkthrough. So if at any point that you got stuck in a game that you were playing, you could find a walkthrough on the internet and it will tell you what you need to do to get past a particular level. I was thinking about that this week and, uh, you know, Jesus is our walkthrough. Jesus is the one who has gone before us, who has made a way for us, who has lived on this planet and set an incredible example for us to follow. And there are times in our lives where we may feel stuck, there are times in our lives where we're not sure what to do next. Jesus is our walk through. And as we look at this particular spiritual exercise today, I want us to remember that Jesus modeled this while he walked this planet. He modeled this so well for us. The spiritual exercise we're going to look at today is called service, servanthood, serving. Now I know as soon as you hear that, um, some of us immediately in our minds we think about stacking chairs because let me tell you if you've been a Christian for any length of time you will at some point have stacked chairs and if you call yourself a Christian and you haven't stacked chairs I suggest you uh, reevaluate your salvation. Uh, stacking chairs is something that comes to our minds uh, immediately and let me just tell you something that Jesus said about himself, not about stacking chairs, about himself. There's an incident in Matthew chapter 20 where um, the mother of two of his disciples comes to Jesus and says, hey Jesus, listen, when you come into your kingdom, will you make sure that my sons, uh, James and John, their names were, will you make sure that one of them sits at your right hand and one of them sits at your left so that there is a, a sense of honor, there's a sense of these guys are the next in command, as it were. Can you imagine being uh, a disciple and then your mom rocking up and having that conversation with Jesus about you? You'd be so embarrassed. Uh, but Jesus has this to say in this, in this uh, narrative. She says, it's Matthew chapter 20, verse 20 says, And the mother of Zebedee's sons came to Jesus with her sons, kneeling down and asking a favor of him. What is it you want, he asked. She said, Grant that one of these two sons of mine may sit at your right and the other at your left in your kingdom. You don't know what you're asking, Jesus said to them. Can you drink the cup I'm going to drink? Yes, we can, they answered. Jesus said to them, you will indeed drink from my cup, but to sit at my right or left is not for me to grant. Those places belong to those for whom they have been prepared for by my father. When the ten heard this as the other disciples, they were indignant with the two brothers, understandably. Jesus called them together and said, You know that the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their high officials exercise authority over them. Not so with you. Instead, whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant, and whoever wants to be first must be your slave, just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many." Jesus made the point very clear to them that he didn't come to this planet 
to be served. He didn't come here to be served. He came to serve. And as our example, that is exactly the way that we should also approach our day-to-day -day lives. That we're not looking to be served, but that we're looking for opportunities to serve. So what does it mean to serve? Well, Philippians chapter 2 uh, verses 3 and 4 says this, Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves, not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of others. I like the way that the Passion Translation puts it. It says, Be free from pride-filled opinions, for they will only harm your cherished unity. Do not allow self-promotion to hide in your hearts, but in authentic humility, put others first, and view others as more important than yourselves. Abandon every display of selfishness. Possess a greater concern for what matters to others instead of your own interests. Very, very simply, serving is about putting others above yourself. This can be a tough thing to grasp and a tough thing to actually apply to our lives because we are inherently selfish. We think about ourselves we think about what we need, about what we deserve, and we want as little bother as possible. And maybe I'm just talking about myself. Maybe you are all sorted. You know, I find it interesting that early on in the journey of the children of Israel, when they were uh, being taken out of Egypt and they were on the journey to get to the promised land, God took them by a particular route. And it says in Exodus, He took them by that particular route because it says He knew that if they had to fight, they would turn back and go back to Egypt because they would take the path of least resistance. And similarly like that in our lives, we are people who like to take the path of least resistance. We want an easy life. We want the gains without the grind. We want the perks without the pain. We want the extras without the exertion. We want the stuff, but we don't want to put the time in or the effort in to make it work. In a prayer meeting recently, um, I think it was Dougal who mentioned this phrase. He said, everybody wants revival, but nobody wants to do the dishes. We want the good stuff, but we don't want to get our hands dirty. So why is it important that we be people who have this attitude of service, have the attitude of a servant, who develop this ability to serve others. Why do we need to do that? Very simply, it's not about us. It's about each other. It's about the community of God. I've been following Jesus for a while now, and um, there are things that I do that I would consider to be service to Him. But there have been many opportunities in my life where I've had the opportunity to serve, and I haven't taken that opportunity for what I would have considered valid reasons. Reasons like this, it's just, it's just inconvenient. It's, I'm, I'm, kinda, I'm doing something else. There are other things that I really want to do. And turning up to put chairs out, I'm going back to chairs. Turning up to put chairs out or to set PA up, it's just, that's not what I want to do. Or I'm too tired. I don't want to stay late and sweep the floor, or hoover up the building. I'm, I'm just too tired. Or here's the kicker. This is not my job. I have a job to do. I have a role to do. It might, at the time, it might have been I'm leading worship and that's what I'm doing. It's not my job to hoover the building at the end of the session. Embarrassingly, those are things that I have thought in the past. And um, the passage I'm going to read to us now, Jesus kind of goes through in, in things that he does and the things that he says and eliminates every single reason that I've mentioned to you, um, embarrassingly for me, completely destroys those reasons. So John chapter 13 is where I want to take us to, a very famous passage of scripture. It says this, It was just before the Passover feast, Jesus knew that the time had come for him to leave this world and go to the Father. Having loved his own who were in the world, he now showed them the full extent of his love. The evening meal was being served, and the devil had already prompted Judas Iscariot, son of Simon, to betray Jesus. Jesus knew that the Father had put all things under his power, and that he had come from God and was returning to God. 
So he got up from the meal, took off his outer clothing and wrapped a towel around his waist. After that, he poured water into a basin, began to wash his disciples' feet, drying them with a towel that was wrapped around him. This would have been horrifying to his disciples. For their master, uh, their rabbi, their teacher to to take on this, this task as a lowly servant. The lowliest of servants would have been the ones who washed feet. And to see their master do this, it would have horrified them. In this case, as in many cases in Scripture, Simon Peter is the one who speaks up. And he came to Simon Peter who said to him, Lord, are you going to wash my feet? Jesus replied, you do not realize now what I am doing, but later you will understand. No, said Peter, you will never wash my feet. Jesus answered, unless I wash you, you will have no part with me. Then Lord, Simon Peter replied, not just my feet, but my hands and my head as well. Jesus answered, a person who has a bath, who's had a bath, needs only to wash his feet. His whole body is clean. And you are clean, though not every one of you, for he knew who was going to betray him. And that was why he said not every one was clean. When he had finished washing their feet, he put on his clothes and returned to his place. Do you understand what I have done for you? He asked them. You call me teacher and Lord and rightly so, for that is what I am. Now that I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also should wash one another's feet. I have set you an example that you should do as I have done for you. I tell you the truth. No servant is greater than his master, nor is a messenger greater than the one who sent him. Now that you know these things, you will be blessed if you do them. Now, Jesus wasn't setting an example here for us to develop a system where we regularly washed each other's feet. Although some traditions would embrace that. And to be honest, there isn't an issue with washing each other's feet. What Jesus was actually saying to his disciples, though, the whole point of this, the the example, the demonstration was that we should serve each other. We should serve each other. I just want to take this passage and and use it to point out a few things that will help us as far as thinking about what serving means. The first thing is this, serving has no limit. This is Jesus, the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, the Savior of the universe. He takes off his outer robe, he wraps a towel around his waist, and he washes his disciples' feet. And I find this a challenge. I find this a challenge because every time I say a job is too menial for me or any time I have the thought that says this job is beneath me, I am actually elevating myself above Jesus because Jesus didn't say that. He served in an incredibly powerful way at this moment where he he made the point that there isn't a limit to the level we can go to to serve each other. Serving is without limit. Serving is also without discrimination. See, Jesus didn't go round the group of disciples, but not wash Judas's feet. And that blows my mind. It says he washed all of the disciples' feet. All of the disciples' feet. And it's easy for us maybe to, to be helpful and to serve the people that we like and the people that we're in relationship and the people that we care about. But what is it like for us to serve those that maybe we don't get on with? Or maybe you've said things about us that aren't true or things about us that we don't like. How do we respond to to those instances when we have an opportunity to serve? Serving is without discrimination. The third thing is this. Serving is based on our relationship with God. It is based on our relationship with God. I love the beginning of the passage. It says... Uh, Jesus knew that the Father put all things under his power and that he had come from God and was returning to God. So he knew who he was. And then out of everything that he knew he was, where he come from and where he was going, he then made a choice to serve his disciples. Our serving comes from our relationship with God. We serve because of who he is and who he has made us. It's not like we, we go through acts of service because we're, we're trying to get closer to God. It isn't about validation. It's about the fact that we serve from a position of who we are, not for things that we think we might get. Our serving is based on our relationship with God. 
and it can have a powerful impact on people around us. A long time ago, I was uh, hanging out with my friend and mentor, a guy called Phil, and he was invited to speak at this huge youth event in the Ulster Hall in Belfast. And so we went along, he was going to be the guest speaker, and he said to me, we'll, we'll, we'll go early. So we arrived maybe an hour and a half, two hours before we needed to be there, and uh, he went up to the guy in the sound desk, he knew the guy who was doing the sound for the event, and he said, what can we do to help? Do we need to move some equipment around? Do you need help bringing stuff in from the van? And the guy said, no, no, we've got it all sorted, you're okay. And it blew my mind, it blew my mind that here was this guy, he was invited to be the guest speaker. And what he was concerned about was making sure that um, everything was done. He was happy to offer his services to help move equipment around. And there were many times that we did youth events together where uh, at the end of the event, we would be the ones hoovering and stacking, ch stacking chairs again at the end of the event. Because there was an understanding that these are just different things that we do. Being the speaker at an event doesn't mean somehow that I can't do the hoovering at the end. We are people who are called to serve and to follow the example of our master and it's based on our relationship with him. Another thing about serving is this, serving is caring. Serving is caring. The first verse of that passage says, Jesus knew the time had come for him to leave this world and go to the Father, having loved his own who were in the world, he now showed them the full extent of his love. Fully showing them how he loved them, he chose to serve them, to demonstrate his love for them. Serving is caring. It is being interested in what is happening around us, being interested in the lives of other people, and putting ourselves in a position where we're able to make a difference to them. It is putting the needs of others before us. Um, a while ago, I was winding Lucas up <clears throat> and um, we were talking, we had had a previous conversation about how our kids will sometimes send a message saying, can you pick me up? And, um, and, and Lucas uh, likes to refer to himself as Uber Dad. He just rocks up and, and picks people up. So I was stuck at college one day. Um, I'd missed the train and had to wait for the next train. And because of the conversation we had, I just thought it'd be funny to send Lucas a text. And the text, so I sent him a message and said, hey, um, I'm stuck at college, can you pick me up? Which is kind of the messages that he would get. The thing that I forgot to do was to put a smiley face on the end of that message. And maybe five minutes after I sent that message, I realized that I hadn't put a smiley face on the end of the message and I remembered who I sent it to and what he's like. Uh, so I called him just to see if he'd read the message and to make sure that he understood that I was kidding. Of course, when I called him, Lucas was at a roundabout because he was already on his way to pick me up. He'd stopped doing what he was doing and he, was, and he jumped in the car and he was on his way to give me a lift. Serving is caring. And uh, there are many ways that we can show each other that we care. Uh, but I think there is something powerful in putting the needs of other people above our own needs, above our own desires, because it is in a way reflecting who Jesus is. Let me read you this quote. This is a quote from uh, Richard Foster. And he says this, Self-righteous service requires external rewards. It needs to know that people see and appreciate the effort. It seeks human applause with proper religious modesty, of course. True service rests contented in hiddenness. It does not fear the lights and blare of attention, but it does not seek them either. Since it is living out of a new center of reference, the divine nod of approval is completely sufficient. So, why do we serve? I'm going to close with three quick reasons why we serve. The first is this. We serve to show our love for each other. Now, in that passage we read, um, Jesus showed the full extent of his love by serving his disciples in this demonstration that he gave to them. And it's the same for us. In Galatians chapter 5, verse 13, it says, For you brothers were called to freedom, only do not let your freedom become an opportunity for the sinful nature, but through love serve and seek the best for one another. We serve because it's an opportunity for us to show love to each other. 
The second thing is this, joy. We serve because there is joy in serving. Psalm 100 verse 2 says, Serve the Lord with gladness and delight. Come before his presence with joyful singing. Someone actually once said, and I couldn't find the, the person who came up with this idea, but someone said the true meaning of joy, J-O-Y, is Jesus first, J, others second, O, and yourself third or last, J-O-Y. And I love that. It, uh, it's a great way for kids to remember, but it's also a great way for us as adults to remember. There is great joy in serving. And it may not be a happy joy. It may, it may be hard and it may be difficult doing what you're doing as far as service is concerned. But there is a joy in knowing that we're fulfilling what our master requires of us. And thirdly and finally, <clears throat> why do we serve? We serve because of obedience. Jesus said, come, follow me. And actually in Luke 9, 23, he says this, if anyone wishes to follow me, he must deny himself, that is to set aside selfish interests, take up his cross daily and follow me. Take up your cross daily and follow me. You now I watch a TV show called The West Wing. It's quite old, but it is brilliant. And there is a scene where uh, the senior staff in the White House have to decide what they're going to do. They've come to a kind of a crossroads in their thinking. It's quite early on in the show. And um, they're all in one room and they, they're looking at each other thinking what we're going to do. And then they go around the room and each of them says this phrase. And it is a brilliant scene. It's a bit cheesy, but it is brilliant. They say this phrase, I serve at the pleasure of the President of the United States. I serve at the pleasure of the President of the United States. And it's a moment where they, they offer their recommitment to do the best that they can do uh, to serve the President. Hey, listen, we have an opportunity not to serve an earthly leader, but to serve the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, to serve the one who gave himself for us. And so we have an opportunity to, to go against those natural inclinations we may have for pride and for laziness sometimes, and instead to say, how can I be of service? How can I serve you today? How can I serve the church today? How can I serve uh, my brothers and sisters? How can I serve the lost today? Help us, Jesus, to be an example, the way you were an example to your disciples. I pray that you help us to seize every opportunity you give us and that we'll be people who serve you well. In Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, Nick, for that latest in our spiritual fitness series, All About Serving. Yes, Jesus came to serve and not to be served. So, as you prayerfully consider what um, that may look like for you as you seek to serve your community or to serve the church, then contact us if there's anything that we can do to help in any way at all. Now, you, if you are teenagers, there will be a Zoom Bible study that will be starting shortly. You'll receive the link. And if you would like to go into the Zoom Coffee Connect, then you are more than welcome. The link will be in the chat or you can use the Zoom room, it's the same Zoom room that we do the Logos and the devotions in, so you're welcome to join us. Of course, you may just want to get on with the rest of your Sunday, and as you go into the week, may God bless you in all that you do, stay in touch, if there's anything that we can do to help, please let us know. Bye for now. <laughs>
You say that you'll come through, but it's been so long. It's like the desert sand goes on and on and on. But I believe there's something on the other side of all this waiting. Where all of these tears are turned to celebrate it. So no more holding back and no more hesitating. Because I know you keep all your promises to me. Who's for me? Who's good? Oh!